Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for such a gracious gift of salvation in Christ Jesus. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, draw us ever closer to faith in Christ Jesus. Draw us ever closer in being a follower of his. All to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One of the most heartbreaking things in life is to see someone who has been freed from addiction go back into the slavery of their addiction. Whether that addiction's alcohol or drugs, it's just heartbreaking to see. I'm going to guess that a number of you know people who have been and then gone back to addiction drugs, alcohol, whatever the case may be. And you've seen them at their worst when they are in slavery to that addiction. And you see how it has destroyed their lives, that it has destroyed their relationships. They often lose their job. It has destroyed them mentally, physically, and spiritually as well. But then, there's actually great joy, isn't there? when they come out of that addiction, when they come out from the slavery to the freedom and a new life. You can even see it in their whole demeanor, right? I don't know if you've ever uh, seen pictures of people who have been on meth and then afterwards, the before and after, it's like two different people. And there's rejoicing in that. But for some, they go back. And it just breaks your heart to see them go back to what was killing them, what was bringing death in their life. And it's heartbreaking. And you often wonder why. Right? Why? How could you give up your freedom and go back to such slavery? Why would you choose death over life? I mean, I've seen this as a pastor, and it is heartbreaking. You do everything in in your power. You persuade. You talk to them. Even tough love, right? And yet, they go back. I've also seen this on the spiritual side as well when it comes to faith. I have seen people born again, and it is a joy to see this new life that they have, right? This brand new life, and they are almost literally just glowing, overflowing with this life. And it is a joy to see. But then I've also seen people who have sometimes quickly, but often little by little, start to revert back to their old ways. And what was once a burning flame of faith becomes dim and even doused. And in this case, you also ask, how could they do that? Don't they know that they have gone from death to life? Why would they ever want to go back to death? You see, in many ways, this is Paul's letter to the Galatians. He has been with them. He has been teaching and preaching He has preached Christ and Him crucified. The Gospel. And He has seen the Galatians come to life. But now there are some who are reverting back to their old ways. And He's thinking, how could you do that? Don't you understand the grace of the Gospel? Why would you go back and add law into the Gospel? One gives you life. The other brings you death. One brings you a curse. One brings you a blessing. This is Paul's letter to the Galatians. It is a heartfelt letter of tough love. Of really calling to them on a personal level. And so today it's actually very simple. It's kind of a two-part message, if you will. The first is, don't you remember how you were saved? And it is 
that you were saved by faith. The righteous live by faith. Don't you remember how you were saved? And you should remember that the righteous live by faith. That's the message today. So let's go through it. Galatians chapter 3, starting with verse 1. Oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. You see, Paul had been going out and he had been preaching Christ and Him crucified. I mean, Christ and Him crucified was always at the forefront of Paul's ministry. It's at the forefront of all of his letters. He talks about Jesus and who He is first before he actually gets to the actual issues. He lays that groundwork. See, He saw them come alive in the gospel of Jesus Christ. He saw that they had a new life. But now some of them were turning, being led astray. And there were some who said, yes, you are saved through Jesus Christ, but you also must be circumcised because if you Gentiles are not circumcised, you are not saved. So he's adding, they're adding the law to the gospel. And Paul says, oh foolish Galatians. I mean, this is a heartfelt cry and a rebuke. He knows that mere sentimentality, that more than mere sentimentality is needed here. You see, when there is spiritual danger, a harder word is often needed in order to confront the error. Foolish Galatians. Now, but he's not calling them stupid. He's calling them foolish, unwise. That they don't have spiritual wisdom or spiritual discernment. And then he he goes on, he says, Who has bewitched you? And this is not just a little mere thing that he's saying. In essence, how could you be fooled? He says, Who has led you into evil? Who has led you into evil? If you were going to paraphrase the first verse, it would be this way. What happened to you? Have you been so deceived by these evil people who have added to the gospel? How could you be so deceived when you vividly heard from me about Christ and Him crucified? So with this setup, he now goes into a series of questions. The first question, by the way, is the primary question. And if they could but answer this, it would solve everything. So let's go to that first question. He says, let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Now, I should note here that this is the first time in Galatians that Paul has used the word spirit. And when we're talking about spirit, you can see it's capitalized. We're not talking about uh, just any feeling. We're talking about God, the Holy Spirit. As one commentator put it so well, the Holy Spirit is central to Paul's description of the life and freedom and love to which every believer is called. You see, it is God the Holy Spirit who convicts you of sin. It is God the Holy Spirit who brings you to repentance. It is God the Holy Spirit who brings you into acknowledgement, into understanding of the mystery of the gospel. It's the Holy Spirit who indwells, who seals, who empowers Christians to follow Jesus, to lead a life pleasing unto the Lord. Put very bluntly, you cannot have a life in Christ without the power of the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who indwells in you and fills your spirit so much that you cry, Abba, Father. This is the power of the Holy Spirit. So it is no mere question that he is asking. He says, let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? To paraphrase it, 
Have you fallen so far that you don't remember even how you came to your own salvation? Were you brought to a new life by the Spirit because you worked so hard and you were such a good Jew or Gentile? Or were you brought to life by the Spirit because you heard the gospel and by faith you believed? Don't you remember what happened? Now you might think all of these questions are overkill, right? But what Paul is doing, and what we do naturally is we ask a lot of different questions to really bring home the point. When you're, you were growing up, did your parents ever ask you a series of questions? Or maybe as a parent, you asked a series of questions. Do you, so you might have asked or been on the receiving end of something like this. What were you thinking? Didn't we talk about drinking? Weren't you right here in the kitchen with me when we talked about the hazards of drinking and driving? Didn't we talk about how much peer pressure can influence you to do things you don't want to do? What were you thinking? Now, again, you might have even said this or been on the receiving end, but you understand this, right? It's a series of questions to bring home the point. <laughs> God uses questions because we are stubborn like mules. And we need to be hit over the head sometimes with these questions. So let's take a look at two of them, and then I want to dive in into the third a little bit more. One is, are you so foolish, unwise? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Look, Paul's saying, you started because of the work of the Holy Spirit in you. And now you think you're so wise that you can just do it all by yourself? By going back to your old nature, the flesh, by going back to the old nature, you think you can live your new life? This is like people who come to church once or twice, have become really enlivened and go, eh, I don't need that anymore. And then they go on their way. And this perplexes Paul. It perplexes me. As a matter of fact, in chapter 4, Paul says, I wish I could be present with you now and change my tone so I could be softer with you. For I am perplexed about you. Now this second question, did you suffer so many things in vain if it indeed was in vain? Look, to be a Christian, to convert either from Judaism or be a Gentile and then become a Christian could be a dangerous thing. And you could be persecuted. Now, it doesn't actually say what the Galatians suffered. We don't know what they suffered, but we can at least have some conjecture that they would have been probably mocked, ostracized. There might even be been physical violence. So Paul is saying here, did you become a Christian and then suffer all of these things just to go back then now in a time so you don't have to suffer anymore? He's perplexed. So he's asking these questions. And now with this third one, he is segueing into Scripture. He's going kind of from their experience to now Scripture. He says this, does he who supplies the Spirit to you and work miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, know then that it is those of faith who are sons of Abraham. Now we've talked about this before, that Abraham was not saved because he was such a great guy that he was so upstanding. He was saved by grace. He was saved through faith, right? Abraham believed God. Abraham heard the promises of God and believed. Period. That's it. 
He believed in the promises of God. And God declared him righteousness because Abraham believed. Not because he was so good, but because he believed. So Paul is really saying that the true sons of Abraham are those who have believed the promises of God. Let that sink in for a moment. The true sons of Abraham are those who believed and believe the promises of God. What makes someone a son of Abraham or a daughter of Abraham, if you will? You believe God's promises. This is what Jesus was talking about when he was with Zacchaeus, right? Zacchaeus, he, the wee little man. He was a tax collector. He was a sinner of, and chief tax collector. So he was a sinner of sinners. And he says, and it's really easy to read this uh, account and think, well, salvation came to Zacchaeus because he said he would repay double. And, and, and he would repay everything that he took, and that he would pay fourfold, actually, fourfold if he had defrauded anybody. So it'd be easy to say Zacchaeus received his salvation because of his good works, but that isn't it. He believed. He believed. He believed in Jesus. And because of that faith, therefore, he gave away his wealth. He would repay by faith. And so Jesus says to Zacchaeus, Today salvation has come to this house since he is also a son of Abraham. Zacchaeus believed. That's what makes one a son of Abraham. Faith in God and his promises. One commentator put it this way. The two children of Abraham share his faith whether they are physically descended from him or not. The promise to Abraham really was one of grace alone through faith alone. And that promise was not just for the Jews. It was for all who would believe. So you have to think, are you a son or daughter of Abraham? And if you believe the promises of God in Christ Jesus, you are. You are. Paul goes on, he says, And the Scripture foreseen that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, Preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Hold on here. It says, The gospel was preached beforehand to Abraham? Abraham lived centuries, centuries and centuries before Jesus. So how could, and and it's the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. So how centuries beforehand could Abraham have heard the gospel? Well, what is the gospel? The gospel is always the promise of grace through faith. And so the promise in you shall all the nations be blessed is a promise of grace through faith that is fulfilled in Christ Jesus. This is how the gospel was preached so long ago. So Paul is pleading, rebuking, correcting the Galatians. What were you thinking? Don't you remember the experience of how you were saved? It didn't come from anything you did It came from the work of the Holy Spirit hearing the gospel. And by hearing the gospel, you believed by faith. And it is the righteous who live by faith. Not by the law, but by faith. One leads to life, the other leads to death. One leads to blessing, one leads to curses. The righteous shall live by faith. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. 
So let's understand this, and I'm going to give you an example here. How many are familiar with Ray Comfort? A few? Okay, so Ray Comfort is actually from Australia, lives in California. Uh, he has a very robust ministry called Living Waters. He's done lots of videos. He is what I would call a true evangelist. It's not that he holds stadium-like events or anything, but he goes and he works with people preaching the gospel. So he's often on Huntington Beach. And you can go online, there's a bunch of videos of him. And that crowd is not necessarily friendly to a message of Christianity or the gospel. So Ray, he's done this for years. He, he has some things that he engages the, the audience with, asks them some questions, gives them dollars if they can answer certain questions. Uh, and so it kind of gets them loosened up a little bit. But invariably... He will ask this question. Are you, or do you think you're a good person? All right, he always gets to that one question. And everybody, of course, says, yes! Who would say they're a bad person? Actually, there are some videos with one or two people say, I'm bad. And you kind of go, ooh, I believe you. Um, but, uh, you know, everybody says they're, they're good. And so he does the good person quiz. Now, I've done this with you a number of times throughout the years I've been here. I'm not going to do it again, but he, he basically asks them questions about the Ten Commandments, right? Have you followed the commandments? And he gives them, have you always been obedient to your parents? And have you ever said God's name in a way that shouldn't be used? And everybody ultimately says, yes. Yes, I've done all of those things. And... He says, so how can you be a good person? Well, they say, well, I, I'm still good. He says, all right, well, imagine this. Imagine now that you are, it's on the day of judgment. It's judgment day. You come before God, and you are going to be judged on the Ten Commandments. Are you innocent or guilty? Oh, and boy, this is where people really get uncomfortable, and they start to want to wiggle out of it. Are you innocent or guilty before God? Now, there are some people who hold fast and say that they're innocent. And so he has to go back to the Ten Commandments. But, he say, and the, but there are some who say, well, I am guilty. And then Ray will say, heaven or hell? And everybody says, heaven. Heaven, I'm in heaven. Oh, sorry, Regina got there. So... <laughs> <laughs> made myself laugh at that one. <laughs> but um, they always say heaven, right? Because they say, well, God's just going to be merciful. He's just going to overlook those sins. And so Ray has to keep working with them when working with them. Why? Because they are addicted to this notion that if they do their best, God will do the rest. That if they try hard enough, that's good enough. And so he really has to bring them to the law first and foremost. He has to rid them of any particular illusion that they have. And it's only until that illusion is broken down that they can see the necessity, the need for the gospel. That's what Ray Comfort does. Paul, in his letter says it's even worse than you can imagine. It's even worse. He says, for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Paul is referring to Deuteronomy chapter 26. And it's really about the blessings and curses Blessings following God's word, curses not following his word. Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now a curse, a curse is a call for harm or injury. Condemned to destruction. In the beginning of Galatians, he, taught, he uses the word accursed, anathema or damnation. So cursed, accursed, 
very similar in the meaning. So if I were going to paraphrase this, it would be, damned to hell is the one who relies on any work of the law for their salvation. For you must be obedient to all of the law. Damned to hell if you rely on the law or your good works for your salvation. Now, can any one of you honestly say that you have kept all of the commandments? Again, just go back to Huntington Beach. Watch any of the videos. You will squirm like anybody else. And we would say, no, of course not. So Paul answers this. He says, now it is evident that no one is justified before God, before God by the law. For the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Here's what the law does. The law demands that you live by the letter of the law. The law is received by obedience, not by faith. And we think about how perfect the law is and how holy and righteous God is. And you try and try and try. It leads you to despair. Paul wrote about this in his letter to the Romans. The end of chapter 7, he says, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And then in the next breath, he answers, answers, answers it. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Why thanks be to God? Because Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. You see, on the cross, he took on everything, right? He took on the curse of the law. He took on the curse of sin. He took on the wages of sin, which is death. He took on everything so that we might be free. You know, during Good Friday, we, we sing this song, how great, how deep the Father's love for us. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know it is finished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. All the demands of the law, the righteousness of the law, my inability to keep any of the law, my sin, all nailed to the cross, it is finished. It is finished then and it is finished for all time. And the song says, I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. I can't boast in how wonderful I am as a pastor, as a churchgoer, how much Bible I study or don't study, I, how good I am. I can't boast in any of that, nothing, zero. The only thing I boast in is Christ Jesus and his resurrection. That's what Paul is writing about here. It is all about Christ. The promises that were declared to Abraham fulfilled in Christ Jesus. Grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And he says, so that in Christ Jesus, the blessings of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. I am a son of Abraham, not because I am Jewish, but because I have believed in the promises of Christ Jesus. I am a Christian, not because I go to church or I was raised in the church. It is because I have faith in the promises of Christ Jesus. I am redeemed, not because of how hard I have tried, 
but in the faith of Christ Jesus. This is what Paul is writing about to the Galatians. It is a heartfelt letter. And if I now, a son of Abraham, a Christian, redeemed all by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone, why would I ever, ever, ever want to go back to my old life? So for you, answer these questions for yourself. Are you a son or daughter of Abraham? If so, how? Are you a Christian? If so, how? And are you free from the bondage of sin? And if so, how? And if all of these are true, why would you ever, ever, ever want to go back to anything else? For freedom, Christ has set you free. Amen? Amen.